Welcome to episode 13 of the Pop Anime Comics Lounge. My guest today is Ian Flynn, writer of Sonic the Hedgehog Comics. But before we get into that, please check out popanimecomics.com. When you click on those affiliate links, I get a small commission at no cost to you when you buy something from Amazon.com, which helps to support this podcast. So without further ado, let's get right into this interview. So Ian, how did you get into comics? Uh, I always had comics. Um... I always grew up on them. I always had them around, uh, whether it was, you know, an Archie book or you know, Get Along Gang or the old Thundercats comic or, you know, any, even in the, you know, Disney comics. I've always had some kind of comic book lying around and grew up on them. So as a kid, were you into comics and what were you reading? Yeah, I was into them not so, uh, any more than, you know, anything particular, but, you know, I would never be one to say no to comics. Never really followed anything hardcore until, I guess, the 90s when I got big into X-Men and kind of followed the Onslaught saga and all the stuff around that. And then when I started doing things professionally, I had a hard time disconnecting myself from the material. So instead of sitting down and enjoying the book, it's like, oh, I see what the writer is doing here. And, oh, I can see the editorial mandate there. And it's like, I'm not reading this anymore. I'm dissecting it. So it's been a long time since I've actually sat down and read a comic. So when did you start to make the transition from being a reader to saying, I want to write comics and then writing the comic? Uh, started when I got into college and started pursuing my English degree and very quickly realized, what am I going to do with this once I graduate? <laughs> and I, I enjoyed writing. I enjoyed reading the Sonic book. So I figured, how hard can it be? I'll just break into the industry. I'm sure people do it all the time. Little did I know. So after about four years of banging on Archie's door, uh, circumstances just happened to line up in the right way that the editor at the time said, all right, kid, you're not bad. Let me show you how it's supposed to be done. And I, because of that one little lucky break, it's been what I've been doing for like almost 10 years now. So how did you get the job with Archie? Uh, the one way they tell you never to try, which is unsolicited springboards, sample scripts, uh, letters of recommendation, just generally saying, hey, I am a writer, hire me, which really is never going to work anywhere else. I just got really, really lucky. So when you were sending this out, what did you use as a guide to you know, send out your mail and your samples to Archie Comics? I didn't have a guide, honestly. Um, right when I was starting to put my proposals, I guess, for consideration, that's when the books first started coming out, describing the philosophy behind comic construction, uh, how other writers have put it together. But before, up to that point, there really wasn't anything. I think right as I got picked up was when Scott McCloud's book first came out. So... I was winging it, pretty much. So, what was your first job with Archie Comics? Uh, the first stuff they had me doing was bookkeeping, basically. Going through all the old issues and compiling data files. You know, this character appeared in this issue. This is what they do. This is where they are. Uh, this is this MacGuffin. It was introduced here. This is what it does. That kind of thing. And did this, you know, first job help you later on when you were doing research for writing other characters for Archie? Comics? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that it basically showed me the ropes on how to do any of it. And I was a complete novice going in. I thought I had a general idea on what to do, and I was completely wrong. So the entire thing was an invaluable learning experience. And when did you begin to write your first comic with Archie Comics? Uh, I first started compiling data in like October of 2004, I think. And then I was named lead, publicly named lead writer by like March of next year. So I, I got, I had a very fast turnaround. And then when did you start to begin to write on Sonic the Hedgehog? That was my first gig. That was the first thing I did straight out of the gate. And growing up, were you a fan of Sonic the Hedgehog and what error of Sonic the Hedgehog? Well, my first real game console was the Sega Genesis. My first real video game was Sonic 2. I'm not counting the Atari 2600. That, I mean, technically that's a video game system, but you know, Pong doesn't really compare to Sonic. And I started reading the books in like middle school, 
So I've always been a fan of the series almost from the very beginning. So when you were writing on Sonic, how did you do your research for Sonic as well as his gang of friends? Again, since I was a fan since pretty much the beginning, I already knew it by heart. I was reading the books. I was playing the games. So it was more or less, it wasn't really research. It was more like the editor said, here's all the toys. Play with them. And obviously you, you took it over from somebody else. What did you find to be difficult about that transition, if anything? It wasn't really difficult at all. The At that point, they had uh, cycled out most of their writing staff. And then when I came on, there wasn't really a transition period. It was just I was handed the book and told, go. And uh, the editor was – the editor had a general idea of where he wanted things to go, but largely left – that was more of a – broader framework more of a i guess a general mentality to apply to the books make them more energetic bring them closer to the source material make them more fun more engaging and otherwise left the plot lines and characterization up to me so you know we were of the same mindset and how the book should go forward he gave me a lot of creative freedom so i just hit the ground running and obviously the the comic has sold amazingly well that you got the opportunity to work on Sonic X. How did this yep. come about? Uh, Sonic X was, truth be told, a cash grab, which is, you know, honestly what the Sonic book is itself. It's a 20-page monthly ad for the games. But, you know, the anime was on the air. It was doing very well. So they put forward to do, you know, the Sonic X tie-in book. Uh, I got to write about a third of that over its 40-issue run. Had a lot of fun with it. Got to be very goofy with it since it was kind of its own thing. And then uh, we could have gone on for another year or two with it, but we were starting to run out of steam on it. The show had gone into syndication, so we weren't really getting the multimedia exposure anymore. So we chose to retire, do, pull a Seinfeld and retire it while it was on you know, the up and up, and then use that as a springboard to launch the Sonic Universe book. So before we get into Sonic Universe, how difficult was it to write a comic book while a TV tie-in was currently going on? Uh, that one, we there were a lot of hoops to jump through compared to regular Sonic since because of the nature of the comic, it was set in this kind of nebulous region of Season 2 because we couldn't get into Season 3 since it was far darker than the other two seasons and was kind of out of theme. And we couldn't go too forward because we couldn't really do anything that contradicted the plot that was present or you know really branch out in another direction so we had to work within the confines of what the show had presented without going too far while maintaining the feel and the characters of the show so there are some mental gymnastics here and there but it was also kind of fun to try to color inside those lines and Sonic X ended, and then Sonic Universe came out on the scene. How do you feel about Sonic Universe's setup, being that every four issues, it's a new story arc? Uh, it was fun in that it gave it its own kind of special feel. It is within the same universe as the regular Sonic book, but it has its own kind of identity in that you know, with Sonic, you can get somewhat more episodic stories, while Universe is your guaranteed uh, mini-movie, so to speak. Uh, it also made it more or less made for trade, so that the uh, trade paperbacks, as they came out, were always of a specific length and were always within a very affordable price point. And do you feel that while you're working on Sonic Universe that you get to, you know, explore more Sonic characters that you normally wouldn't get to explore in the regular Sonic book? Oh, absolutely. Because with the regular Sonic book, you know, it's Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic's got to be the star. He needs to be present in some capacity. Whereas with Universe, it's, you know, his greater universe, he doesn't necessarily have to be present or even mentioned at all. So that gives us a lot more creative freedom to focus and explore other characters in other regions without having to justify, okay, why is Sonic here and does this contradict the main book? No, because Sonic is over there doing his thing and then Universe is over here doing its thing. Now, in 2014, if you didn't work on enough Sonic titles already, you started to work <laughs> on Sonic Boom. 
where did this idea come from? Uh, same thinking as Sonic X. You know, the show is out, uh, and whereas X was already kind of going into its uh, last little bit, Boom was fresh on the scene. It had games. It had, you know, the TV show. So why not go ahead and capitalize on all this uh, multimedia attention and do a book that goes along with it? Do you feel that you were in a similar situation as Sonic X with Sonic Boom where you were tied up with the TV show and the games? No, because Boom... It's, with Sonic X, it was its own special, unique brand of Sonic specifically within the confines of the show. There wasn't any other real media around it. With Boom, it was... It's so much looser in how it's constructed. There isn't, you know, a real continuity between episodes. It's, you know, Sonic and the gang do this thing. And Sonic and the gang do that thing. And it can be as goofy as you want it to be. So there's a lot more freedom where you don't have to worry about, you know, okay, Sonic said this in issue one, so therefore he has to abide by it by issue nine. It's no, you know, they go go karting in this issue. And then in this issue, there's a gorilla. It doesn't really have to sync up. It's just Sonic and it's fun. It's like Looney Tunes, but with the Sonic cast. So out of all the Sonics that you worked on, do you have a favorite one that you participated in? They are all fun. I think I enjoy mainline Sonic and Sonic universe a bit more just because there's a little more meat to them. But I do miss working on Boom the comic insofar as, you know, it was kind of cathartic. You didn't, it was the uh, easy mode, so to speak. You could have a little more fun and not have to worry about all the gears and pieces fitting in exactly. Now, in 2011, you began to write Mega Man. How did Mega Man come into the Archie universe? Uh, that was Capcom, actually. They saw the success we had had with the Sonic books. And said, hey, we're going to do this big Mega Man promotion. Uh, would you like to do a comic to help us out with that? And we said, why, yes. Yes, we would. And then things notoriously went south on the gaming end of things. But Mega Man went pretty darn strong for a 20-year-old property. And Mega Man obviously has a rich history. So how do you do research for Mega Man? And what errors did you, you know, particularly focus on with your research? Well, thankfully, the Mega Man book was specifically and exclusively the classic era for the first little bit, so that helped narrow the search a bit. The fandom was an invaluable resource between, you know, comprehensive playthroughs of the game online, uh, robust wikis. There are a number of uh, art books out there that are just filled to the brim with all sorts of nuances and information. So it was just a whole lot of watching and a whole lot of reading. And then in 2013, you got the opportunity to work on a crossover between Sonic and Mega Man when worlds collide. How was this concept formed? Uh, this, again, was uh, Capcom's thing. They came to us and said, hey, you have the licenses for both these comics, wouldn't it be cool if you did a crossover? And Archie said, that would be cool, but only if Sega's willing to play ball. And Sega said, yeah, yeah, no, that's cool. Go ahead, do it. So my editor at the time called me up and said, so we've got this deal on the table. Do you think you could have a pitch ready for us? And I'm like, yeah, I kind of already wrote one for fun. I didn't think this would ever happen, but uh, here you go. And we just hit the ground run with that and had – an absolute ball with it. So how much fun did you have writing this crossover? I had all the fun. Everyone else in the world was sad because I was enjoying all the fun in the world as I wrote that. Now, were, were there any challenges that you came across when doing this? Oh, sure. There were. Um, the challenges were honestly more internal and personal than it was with the companies because Capcom and Sega were an absolute dream to work with, at least on my end. They were very understanding and open to all the creative stuff that we did with it. For me, it was just figuring out where it fit in the timeline for the two books. Uh, the Sonic continuity was going through a bit of a upheaval because of external uh, legal shenanigans. And with Mega Man, we hadn't even gotten to... Mega Man 3 yet in terms of the timeline but 
I didn't want to ignore all the stuff that came later. I mean, you can't really do that big of a crossover and not show base and just be criminal. So, you know, figuring out how to make all these continuity timeline jumps and make them accessible to both people who, you know, maybe only played half the games in their lives and the folks who've been reading this for years and years and make it all make sense and be accessible was a bit of a challenge. But I think we pulled it off. When did you find out that you were going to be able to do a sequel to the crossover? That one was kind of always in the cards, especially when the first sales numbers came in. But that was worked on for a long time, lots of negotiation, lots of talk back and forth, well above my head. And then uh, we started, I guess, preliminary planning of it a year before it was formally announced. I don't know. It's been a long time. I don't keep track of it all that well. And, and obviously both you know, Mega Man and Sonic are owned by other entities. So how do you find it to be able to work within their parameters of the characters? Well, it's partly seeing how they've portrayed the characters in the past. I uh, learn from what they've done, see, you know, infer from that what they want. Part of it is treating it with respect. I mean, these are somebody else's properties. You can't really just do your own thing with them. And between the two of those, I think that gave me the framework to work within that covered most of the bases. And then as we got things approved and moved forward, you know, anything that started to stray off of what they wanted, they would give us feedback and we would, you know, correct it from there. So do you find it easier or harder as a writer? Always have to, you know, have Sonic be an energetic hedgehog and Mega Man be a certain way. I don't find it that hard because to me, that's, that's the characters. That's the confines with, within which to work. It's, you know, it isn't my own property where I have to figure out who this character is and where they need to go and you know what is their end goal. With Mega Man, you know where it's going. There's been 10 games in the main line. You know exactly what he's going. And with Sonic, you know who he is and what he's about and how he would react. So it's less about figuring out the characters and more about putting them into situations and rationalizing, okay, how would they react and how would they play out in these scenarios? Now, you've also worked on Sonic comics that deal with the video games. How do you go about formulating a comic that is a prequel to a video game? Uh, Those are usually requested by Sega specifically to promote whatever game is coming out. And in those scenarios, they give us some kind of material to work with. Sometimes it's concept art. Sometimes it's scripts. Sometimes it's, you know, just a little cut scene to work with. But in all those regards, we tried to be as close as possible to the source material because those aren't really, you know, stories. They're more of a prelude or, um, I guess, teaser for the thing itself. It's a more blatant ad than the regular comic, I guess. Now, outside of Sonic and Mega Man, you've also done work on New Crusaders. How are you approached to do New Crusaders? Uh, That was when Archie first started to revive a lot of its old properties. And they had just gotten back the rights for the Red Circle superheroes that they uh, licensed out to DC for who knows how long. And because of my success with you know the Sonic and Mega Man books, they figured, all right, give it to this guy. He knows what he's doing. So there was a lot of creative <clears throat> input um, from a number of parties. I, I wouldn't say I had as big an influence as with other books I've worked on, just because, you know, this was reviving this old set of characters. So there were a lot of other voices chiming in all at once and basically fell to me to filter it all out and make it into concise directed vision, I suppose. When, when you create a story between all your works, do you have, you know, a way that you map out your story? Oh yeah, absolutely. Usually what I do is plot things out by about a year, uh, issue by issue, you know, what, is the overall goal for the foreseeable future and you know what does each issue accomplish towards that these don't always go as planned because you never know when oh this new game is coming out so we have to postpone everything and shove in this adaptation or you know, some other for unforeseen circumstance comes up so we have to change this over here or oh no the licensor didn't like that so we have to scuttle those plans and start from scratch but it still gives me 
an overall guide of where I'm going with things. And when you're mapping this out, when does an artist come in? Uh, the process goes like this. First, I submit the springboard, which is about a paragraph long that states, you know, this is what I want to do for the story. Here's the title. Here's the characters. Here's what gets done. If that gets approved, we move on to the breakdowns, which are a page-by-page -page synopsis of the issue. So page one, this happens. Page two, this happens. Just keep it to like a simple sentence so that if we need to revise anything, we're moving around sentences instead of entire paragraphs. Once that gets approved by the editor and the licensor, then we move on to the manuscripts, which is the blueprints for the comic. That's my main job. So you'd have page one, panel one, which is this size, this configuration on the page, in this setting, with these characters doing this, saying this, panel two, and so on and so forth. That goes to editorial for approval, that goes to licensor for approval, after that, then, then it goes to the penciler, penciler then sends it on to the inker, the inker then sends it to the letterer, letterer sends it on to the colorist, and all of this gets approved both at the editorial and licensor level, and then it goes to the printer. How long does this process usually take? Uh, depending on the scenario, usually three to six months. Unless, you know, something comes out of the blue and then we all scramble and we get it done in like two months. And then those are a bit hectic. Now to focus on your website a little bit, you created the website, the Bumble King. BumbleKing.com. Can you briefly describe the services you provide on your website? Uh, well, Bumble King is basically... A uh, very, very elaborate uh, resume online, more or less. It uh, just goes over all the things I've done over the course of my career and you know sets it up for anyone who is interested in hiring my services. I am a freelance writer, so I live and die by the project. Uh, I've had the good fortune of having very consistent work from Archie for many, many years, but you know, that doesn't mean I'm not open to... You know, big projects, small projects, you know, anyone, really. And, and do you have a favorite character that you've worked on while, during your time with Archie? There are so many to choose from. I don't know, some, the ones that, you know, are nearest and dearest to my heart usually become the ones I focus on, and they become fan favorites, and then the stressor becomes to keep them on that pedestal so that everyone still enjoys them to the same degree, like... There was this obscure Sonic character, Bean the Duck, from this um, one arcade fighting game. And I thought he was delightful, so I brought him into the comic and made him this goofy, uh, one-line slinging, one-liner slinging mercenary. And people loved him. They thought he was hilarious. And it's like, great, now I've got to be consistently funny. And comedy is hard. So... I always try to find something to enjoy with every character so that I'm never, you know, begrudgingly writing something. So I don't know if I can pick a favorite. And then finally, before we get into some promos, do you have any advice that you can give to people who want to write comics? Um, write all the time, even if nobody else is going to see it. doesn't matter whether it's a short story, a poem, limerick, whatever. Even if it's garbage and you throw it out later. Just write every day because it helps keep those mental muscles in the right position so that you can dive into it. There's nothing harder than, you know, going a week or two without writing anything and then trying to get back into the mindset. You can kind of feel your mental gear slipping. Uh, also would recommend reading a bunch of various material, read stuff that you don't like, watch movies that you don't like, listen to music that you don't like, and don't just, you know, dismiss it. But analyze why you don't like it. What is it that doesn't work? What is it that does work? And for the same thing, you know, look at stuff that you do enjoy. Why do you enjoy it? What is it about this story, this show, this piece of music that works for you? And how can you emulate that? What, how can you take the success of that thing and apply it to your own work? I'm not saying copy it, obviously. I'm just saying learn from that structure. And have tenacity and a bit of stubbornness because it is a very difficult industry to break into. Uh, you are not necessarily going to get to do what you want to do straight out of the gate. I got very lucky with that regard. Just, you know, you're going to get a whole lot of no before you get yes. And so you, it's discouraging, but you have to keep at it. I mean, I was trying to get onto the Sonic book for a solid four years without even getting a no. All I got was silence until I got my break. So 
keep at it, keep practicing, do your own thing, and eventually, hopefully something will turn out for you. And then before we go, do you have anything that you would like to promote? Uh, we've got the second Sonic and Mega Man crossover going on right now, Worlds Unite. It's nearing its end. Part 11 comes out next week. Uh, obviously, we've got the Sonic and Sonic Universe books going right now. I have a Patreon project that's very slow going right now called Raiders of the Abyss. The premise of it is it's a sci-fi story where the patrons get to decide how the next chapter goes along. It's kind of a choose-your-own-adventure type of story, but with uh, the decisions made by those who give me money. Uh, we're still in the first chapter. I'm working on updating the perks for those who contribute. You can find it at patreon.com backslash Ian Flynn BKC. Overall, if you want to be on top of what I'm talking about and what I'm working on, my Twitter handle, Ian Flynn BKC, or my website, bumbleking.com, will usually be updated with whatever I'm doing at the time. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this week's podcast. And remember to subscribe to this podcast so it finds you and you don't find it. And please follow me on Twitter at Pop Anime Comics for updates on when new episodes of this podcast come out. And my website and articles that are constantly posted on my website. Till then, everybody have a great week and I will see you next podcast.